Hello, and welcome to episode number 371 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell, and I'm trying a new recording setup for this episode. So if you think this intro and outro sounds really good, or if you're thinking, oh, it sounds terrible, do let me know, because I'm trying new things over here. I'm also chatting today with Amanda and AJ. AJ is one of our new reviewers, and AJ and Amanda are both obsessed with Gideon the Ninth. They have a severe book hangover. I think there might be Halloween costumes in the making, and they are dying to talk to someone about it. So I connected them and recorded their conversation as they tried to answer a lot of questions. What genre is this book? Who are their favorite characters? Why did it give them both some epic levels of book hangover? Now, if you're not familiar with Gideon the Ninth, it came out on September 10th. It hit the New York Times, and the tagline was Lesbian Necromancers in Space. Folks who read it seem to be obsessed, but if you're not familiar, here's the cover copy so you have a sense of the book. The Emperor needs necromancers. The ninth necromancer needs a swordsman. Gideon has a sword, some dirty magazines, and no more time for undead nonsense. Sounds good, right? Brought up by unfriendly, ossifying nuns, ancient retainers, and countless skeletons, Gideon is ready to abandon a life of servitude and an afterlife as a reanimated corpse. She packs up her sword, her shoes, and her dirty magazines, and prepares to launch her daring escape, but her childhood nemesis won't set her free without a service. Harrowhawk, Nonagesimus, reverend daughter of the Ninth House and Bone Witch Extraordinaire, has been summoned into action. The Emperor has invited the heirs to each of his loyal houses to a deadly trial of wits and skills. If Harrowhawk succeeds, she will become an immortal, all-powerful servant of the resurrection, but no necromancer can ascend without a cavalier. Without Gideon's sword, Harrow will fall and the ninth house will die. So we're going to spoil the heck out of this book. We're also going to spoil Feed. We're going to spoil Harry Potter. And in a moment of great scandal, we're also going to talk about where we bailed on the Potter series. So if that's going to really tick you off, you might want to skip this one. This podcast is brought to you by Once a Spy by Mary Jo Putney. Can a marriage of convenience for two spies blossom into something more? Renowned for her unique blend of adventure, wit, and sweeping romance, New York Times best-selling and one of romance's most critically acclaimed authors, Mary Jo Putney, matches Simon, a dashing spy, with Suzanne, a French woman whose past will bear no scrutiny. Neither wanted or expected a true marriage, but as Suzanne joins Simon in a search for his long-missing foster brother, Warmth and caring begin to heal both their scars, and a powerful passion sparks between them. Then, news from France threatens to disrupt their happiness. Napoleon has escaped from Elba, and Wellington personally asks Simon to prevent another devastating war. Only this time Simon does not go into danger alone. Their hard-fought love grows against the backdrop of the Battle of Waterloo in the latest Rogue's Redeemed novel. Once a Spy by Mary Jo Putney is on sale now wherever books are sold and at kensingtonbooks.com. For more information, visit maryjoputney.com. Every episode of this here podcast receives a transcript, and that transcript is hand compiled by Garlic Knitter. Thank you, Garlic Knitter. If you are a member of the Patreon community, you have helped with this week's podcast transcript. Thank you very, very much. You are making sure that every episode is transcribed and is therefore accessible to everyone. If you'd like to join our Patreon community to support the transcript, keep the show going, it would be awesome. Have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. Monthly pledges start at one entire dollar per month. That's $12 a year. And every pledge means a lot and keeps the show going. So thank you to the Patreon community for supporting this week's transcript. Coming up at the end of the podcast, I will have a preview of what's coming up on Smart Bitches this week. I'll have information about the music you're listening to. I'll have an absolutely dreadful joke because you know how much I love them. I also will have in the show notes at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast all of the links that we talk about in this episode. And there are many. If you, like Amanda and AJ, want to take a deep dive into the world of Gideon the Ninth, the links will definitely help you out. And of course, we will link to all of the books that we discuss in this episode. And of course, there are many. So let's get on with it. Shall we? AJ and Amanda are going to tell you all about the wonderful things inside Tamsin Mir's Gideon the Ninth and why it gave them epic book hangover. Welcome, AJ. I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited to be here. 
Would you please introduce yourself? Because this is your first appearance on our podcast since you joined our reviewing crew, and I'm really excited to have you. So would you introduce yourself to the folks who will be listening? Absolutely. So um, I am AJ. I am one of the the newer people on the reviewing crew, which I guess you just said. I am a lifelong reader, obviously. That's why I'm here. I'm also a lifelong nerd. So before I was interested in romance, I was interested in sci-fi and fantasy. I've been reading that since I was itty bitty. And um, uh, the things about me that are relevant for this book, I grew up in a very small town. We were about 10 years behind the rest of the country technologically. So we didn't have a lot of internet until I was in high school. So while the other nerdy kids were coding their first website, I studied the blade. <laughs> this is absolutely true. You studied I was, the blade. Yes, I was a fencing instructor. That was my first job. So I was a uh, queer goth kid in a small town who was obsessed with swords. And uh, that's. And I'm now a queer goth adult in a larger town who still really likes swords. So this book was kind of pretty much. <laughs> this was all your catnip. Oh my gosh, I can't even tell you. Squee, man, squee. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to forego an intro. Who are you? Because what I'm lazy. <laughs> what, what, why? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason why I liked this book is because I was also a goth kid. And I am a a lovely bisexual lady. I just enjoyed this a lot. And I, I like books that have more like darker magic. So if you got blood magic in it, I'm all about it. You got necromancy in it, I'm all about it. Um so and hearing the phrase like lesbian necromancers in space, that's that's kind of cool. Right. Like <laughs> you don't really need any more any more description than that. I remember I remember when you told me yeah, about I was this, so- I was like, I didn't know I needed those words in that order. Yeah, I was just going to say I was sold. I saw the cover and it said lesbian necromancers in space. And I was like, well, buy in this one. (laughs) I got one of the ones that has the like black on the edges of the pages. I got the hardcover. Oh, it matches my decor so beautifully. I was so excited when they announced like the first printing was going to have black stained edges. And I remember tweeting at the tour account. I was like, Okay, so how do I get this? What special things do I need to do? They're like, all you have to do is just like pre-order it at your lo- <laughs> local store. That's literally all you have to do. First printing will have all of it. I was like, mm, okay, I will I do that. I left out. My local store had one copy left with the black edges. Oh you my know, gosh! Oh, I hope I brought it. Out. I brought it home, and it's on the bestseller list. Yes, um, it's on the bestseller list. Um, we changed our display yesterday and it was sitting on there. Um, but I brought it home and my roommate was like, well, I'm going to have to get this now. So <laughs> next time you're at the store, can you just grab me a copy and I'll Venmo you the money? I was like, okay. Yeah, my roommate stole my copy today and took it to work with her. So I was like, hey, um, can you bring me Giddy in the night so I can look stuff up for the podcast? And she's like, oh, sorry. Um... You can't have it back. <laughs> what a coincidence, because so, well, I also let my roommate borrow my galley copy of Lee Bardugo's Ninth House that I had to move heaven and earth to get, and she lent it to someone at work, and I was like, hey, can you get that back for me? Because I need to review it. And the person has misplaced it. <gasps> that is grounds for yeah. serious murder. I'm so mad. I'm so mad. But- my roommate got a hookup from someone else at work who has a copy. So now I'm borrowing someone else's copy, but I am so mad. So mad. Yeah, that's grounds for losing lending privileges yeah. in my oh, yeah. house. We we take our books very seriously around here. My roommate is an English teacher, so we have an entire room of our house that is just bookshelves with her books in my book. Wow, hard save. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but our dining room is all of my roommates' books, and the living room is all of my books. And we catalog our books through library thing, so you can like scan the the barcode and automatically like puts it into the app. And I think between us, we have sur- 
past 1200 bucks in this apartment. Yeah, we have a problem. <laughs> it's only a problem if it's a problem for you. Otherwise, it's a problem. It's a problem because we are running out of available space to put shelves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That we did just have this conversation last night um, where my roommate was like, bookshelves are 30% off at Target. And I was like, <laughs> where are you going to put more bookshelves? We're out of walls. My roommate just took advantage of that sale and had a, <laughs> had a new <laughs> shelf delivered on Monday. So we are we are slowly losing space. I told her she's more than welcome to cover up the dining room windows because we don't use them or open them. So who needs natural light? I'm saying we're, you know, goths. We don't need light. No. We drive in the dark. Okay, so should we tackle trying to describe this book aside from just lesbian necromancers in space in case anyone needs more of a nudge? So where were the lesbian necromancers? In space. Okay, just, just making sure that's clear. <laughs> Houses in space. Got it. Yes. I think the houses are like planetary systems or planets. I wasn't really clear on what constitutes a house. They all have their like different things. Like they're all in charge of different, I wouldn't call it like sectors, but the ninth house is like in charge of like death. There's a a poem at the beginning that kind of succinctly describes like what each house represents. Um, so if, if one group of planets or, or a realm or an area is in charge of a specific thing, does that mean they govern that for the other houses as well? I'm looking. I'm looking at my, at my, <laughs> my copy right now. So, I feel like, yeah, some of that stuff wasn't super clear as to how the society actually worked with that. Yeah, but it's like so for the second house – is called the Emperor's Strength, House of the Crimson Shield, the Centurion's House. And their symbol is like a skull with like a face plate over it. Um, right, and they were basically the army. I remember that yes. now. Yeah. Um, I mean, but so this is the... I have the poem right here. So there are nine houses. The first house is like the Emperor's House, who is like the ruler of all the houses. And then the poem is, two is for discipline, heedless of trial, three for the gleam of a jewel or a smile, four for fidelity facing ahead, five for tradition and debts to the dead, six for the truth over solace and lies, seven for beauty that blossoms and dies, eight for salvation no matter the cost, nine for the tomb and for all that was lost. So I'm curious, can you describe how they interact with each other? Like, are they all at war? Do they hate each other? Are they like cupcakes and they're all at war? They're not at all at war. Why are so cupcakes the, at war? Can you tell me that? I don't know. <laughs> one, one cupcake shall reign supreme. <laughs> um, are we talking actual cupcakes here? Is there a cupcake war? Well, there's cupcake wars about? on the Food Network. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wow, I didn't realize cupcakes were so hard. <laughs> um, but so like the conceit of the book is that all of the houses are called to engage in this like giant like trial. So it's like the heads of houses. Please correct me if I'm wrong, AJ. But it's like the heads of houses I, so and cool. their what is it called? They're cavalier, kind of like their bodyguard cavalier. or something like that, um, are called to this trial. And it's kind of like never happened before. Um, and they kind of have to like battle it out in a sense. So they're but before they're this, they were never yeah, so at war. They just kind of – they all have their roles to play in kind of like the the governing of their space kingdom. Right. There's like rivalry, like court rivalry, you know, the tension between them, but it's not like they're fighting each other. Right. Because they all have their lanes. You know what I mean? They stay in their lane. They handle like, you know, money or the dead or protection or the military. So but of course, there's like competition and 
and scandal and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And the, the competition that they're called to, like the emperor has these lieutenants basically that are also very powerful and, and undying and whatever. And so he, he needs more. He's calling them up to try and become worthy to be one of his lictors, which are the, uh, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Which are the lieutenants. I think so. That's, that's how I, I would kill that. for a glossary of some sort and a pronunciation guy. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Um, they had at the, I don't know if this was in the copy that you read, they had like a dramatis personae at the beginning. So they at least had like who everybody was and what house. Yes. They were and that was helpful because otherwise I would not, it would have been a little hard to keep them apart. Um, well, like I'm, some of, some of the language uh, like cavalier, it, you have to figure out what the hell a cavalier is through context clues. It's like <laughs> one of those things. I'm like, what the hell is a cavalier, like primary or pr- whatever it is. Yes. I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so you just, there are some concepts that you have to glean through reading. Yeah, I think she did a good job with that in a lot of ways because there's so much going on in this world and she doesn't really pause to describe any of it. Right. One of my notes for discussing this was necromancy. How does it work? Why does it power everything? Who cares? (laughs) Minor details. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I, I also, now that I'm looking at my notes, I had a one sentence description for this book, which is the book Agatha Christie would have written if she'd been lesbian and also a goth and also lived in space. <laughs> it all comes back to being in space. It's really, it's an important factor. I, I like space a lot. Why do you say that it's uh, what Agatha Christie would have written? What made, what reminded you of Agatha Christie? The plot there, I mean, a lot happens. It's a long book, but it really essentially felt like a locked room mystery to me. Oh, so We have all of these characters. I can, I can see that because a bulk of like the mystery takes place in like this haunted palace. Yeah, we have these 18 people. 18 is two times nine? Yeah, okay. We have these 18 people that like get taken to this palace and dropped off there by their little space shuttles. And then the space shuttles like are gone and they, they can't leave until they complete the challenge. And then people start dying. So, so it's kind of like like Clue, but in space. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that I I like that. That's a good good way to think of it. And we have also like the everybody's kind of a little bit snotty. And in my review, I wrote like everyone is just like a weird like villain slash anti hero, anti heroine. Like there's <laughs> like. Everyone has like a little thing that gives you pause and you're like, uh, okay. (laughs) Well, they're all like pretty terrible people. And I say this with a lot of love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People. There's no like uniformly good person in this book. And I think they're also, when you look at how the world is set up, they think they're the good guys, but they're clearly the bad guys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Their magic runs off of death and they talk about the fact that they send the army to kill a bunch of people so that they can use the death energy to power the rest of the society. Like they're they're the bad guys. Something that I I want to talk about primarily is obviously Gideon is the main character because the book is called Gideon mm-hmm. the Ninth. However, I would say my favorite character is Harrow. Who's Harrow? Harrow? I like so Harrow Harrow Hark is essentially Gideon's master. She rules the ninth house. At the start of the book, Gideon is trying to leave the ninth house. She's been an indentured servant and she's like, I'm sick of this shit. I'm leaving. And Harrow kind of has known about this plan for a good week or so <laughs> and catches Gideon as she's trying to leave, does this really badass power move where she's like, listen, you can leave, but I really need you to come to like this, this meeting that's being called. And Gideon thinks it's like a farce. And if she goes to the meeting, it's just going to be a trap, but it's not. Harrow's like, we'll fight. And if I win, you come to the meeting, you do what I ask of you, and then you get your freedom. If you beat me, you can just leave right now. 
Gideon says, okay, because Harrow agrees to, like, take off all her, like, armor that she has and kind of, like, fight one-on-one. And Gideon thinks, well, if Harrow doesn't have this, like, it's easy. I'm a, I'm an accomplished swordswoman. I can do this. But there's this moment where the the fight starts and Gideon notices that Harrow's hands are caked in dirt. And because Harrow has known that Gideon had planned to leave, she spent all night digging up the ground and burying bones beneath their feet and covering the covering them back up so she can raise the dead during the fight. So she like planned ahead because she like knew this was going to happen and kind of like outsmarted <laughs> Gideon. And when Gideon realizes that, she's like, oh, fucking shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've been had. I think that's almost um, a direct quote from the book of what she Yeah, I know. So I, Gideon is very snarky and like quippy, but there's something so dry about like Harrow's delivery and her personality that I just loved. She's like, okay, get in. Yeah, you're making a show of yourself. Great. Okay, we have work to do. So can you like wrap it up? <laughs> like, <laughs> she is like a, a, a space business bitch. Like, she, <laughs> is, she is there to get shit done. And she's take no prisoners. And I think I liked, I liked her more, uh, slightly more than Gideon. See, I didn't quite get on board with Harrow, and I think part of it is that it took me quite a long ways into the book to realize what an unreliable narrator Gideon was. Oh, yeah. He totally is. She reminds me a lot of Murderbot, if you've read those books. Yes, I just read that, like, last week. So good. Those are some of my favorites. But it's that, like, I'm going to be really snarky about everyone and say that I don't care about them in the narration. But yeah, my but, like, you're, show that yeah. I actually care the most. And I'm just lying to myself and also to you. Yes. Um, so it took me a while to figure that out. So I was just on board with Gideon and like, she hates Harrow, Harrow's terrible, whatever. And then I didn't quite get it or like really like her until the um, swimming yeah. pool scene. Where she just baldly is like, yo, so this happened and my entire existence is an abomination and I'm a war crime. What up? <laughs> it's like, you <laughs> think you know me. <laughs> like, uh, you're wrong. Right. And then I was like, okay, all right, okay, I like this person now. Um, so I'm going to be interested to see kind of how that oh all plays out. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I mean, the ending is one where I had to read over because I'm like, wait, what? What's happening? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I think I need to read that final like fight scene again to really get it. Um, My understanding, and hello, spoilers, my understanding at the end is Gideon is still alive, but no one knows what happened because they can't recover a body. But the Emperor says that, like, Gideon's, like, soul is in Harrow now. Yeah. Because, like, like-, Har- like, Harrow makes some comment of, like, she didn't want to look in the mirror because she was worried that she wouldn't find a trace of, like, Gideon staring back at her. Yeah, so my understanding, and this, I'm going to, back up a little bit just for for clarity for those playing along at home um so each <laughs> each house sends two representatives right so they have a necromancer who can do all of the magical necromancy raise the dead stuff and then they have the cavalier primary who's like the champion for the yes. necromancer who does their physical fighting and they're they all seemed like really really close bonded pairs like they're super super close to each other they basically live together until one of them dies or they're supposed to die at the same time I wasn't really sure but so then to become again major spoilers here to become a lictor the necromancer has to kill the cavalier and like absorb their spirit that's right and I should say that Gideon is technically not Harrow's cavalier her cavalier is like a, a, a shitty dude who's like a giant mama's boy and when it's revealed that they have to do this, he kind of, like, bails and refuses to go. Yeah, and ends up dying. He's kind of like Sir not appearing in this book, really. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's probably for the best that like Gideon wound up being the cavalier. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gideon is this almost like magical girl. Uh, not not stereotype, I wouldn't say, but the the archetype, right? She's mysterious antecedents and nobody really knows who she is and she's the only one who survived this catastrophic event and she is the doesn't best know who life. like her family is yeah and and there's a bit where someone's like how how long would it take you to turn a long sword fighter into a rapier fighter and the arms mistress says years but for Gideon three months <laughs> <laughs> like she's like a prodigy yeah which is, I think, really common for that type of character in fantasy novels. Like, there's a lot of fantasy elements to this, even though it's set in space. Yes. And one of those is the, like, I'm the best swords person anybody's ever seen. I'll kick your ass. I'll kick my ass. I'll kick your dog. Like, <laughs> and, and Gideon really is, I think, a representation of that, which I love because that's, you know, growing up on T- Tamora Pierce books. In my review, because I, when I talked about it, someone's like, uh, so I'm confused at what kind of genre this is. It's in space, but there's magic. I was like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yep. yeah, I mean, it does have fantasy elements. It does have sci-fi elements. It does have high fantasy elements. Like, it is a weird little mishmash of a book. I think that's one of the things I like about it is it doesn't necessarily neatly fit into a genre. Yes. And I also find that the more sci-fi and fantasy you read, the more they tend to overlap anyway. So it it wasn't I wasn't sitting there going, but which is this? I was just like, yeah, give me all the things. I want some chocolate in my peanut butter. Let's do this. <laughs> and I want some peanut butter in my chocolate. <laughs> AJ, what characters did you like most? Gideon was definitely my favorite. Um, I actually kind of want to be Gideon for Halloween. Do and it. I say, do oh. it. <laughs> aren't you like, <laughs> I've seen the cover. Aren't you like three quarters of the way there? Pretty much. Nerdy yeah. goth <laughs> sword play. <laughs> it's gonna be- you, you've got time. I guarantee yeah, you've got the black clothes, probably. And you probably have yeah. a sword. You just need the face paint. I just need the face paint, some aviator sunglasses, and I need to dye my hair red. Like, I already have the same haircut that she has on the cover. So, so. Easy. So, so good. Um, and I, I actually really was happy that the cover was a completely accurate representation. I, like, started reading and it describes her and I was like, oh, my God, that's exactly what she looks like. <laughs> I'm curious um, to see what the next book cover will be. Right? I want to see a picture of Harrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Gideon was definitely my favorite. I did eventually get on board with Harrow, and I also really liked. There's um, a couple of other characters who are from the the sixth house, which is like the scholarly house, I think. Yeah, and uh, Poemides and Camilla, and they were great. I really liked them. I I am a sucker for like an, a big ensemble cast, and this is yeah. what <laughs> like like I love a good Christopher Guest mockumentary movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god if we ever made it into a movie i would really want it to be that style yeah so and i just i love a book that has you know like a breakdown of all the different people i love house politics i love themes so like houses that have their their own little theme i'm into mm-hmm. this like tapped into all of the strange idiosyncrasies that i have about books yeah it really was such incredible catnip and like this is one so we just had that discussion about when a book is taking over your life and you read it like super super fast and I am hyper focused on reading so when I start a book I usually will finish it in one sitting maybe two this one I slowed down because I didn't want it to be over it is I was like I a lot of book too yeah yeah, I was like 250 pages in and I was like, oh no, I only have 250 pages left. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely one of those books that as you get closer to the end, you're like, oh no. <laughs> because how are we going to wrap this up? And then like once it's over, you're like, well, shit, like how long am I going to have to wait to like return to these characters because it's such like a fun book and I enjoyed being in it that 
you know, it's a little sad. They're like, oh, I'm going to have to wait until, what is it, like 20-something 2020 for Harrow's book? Yep, that's definitely part of the hangover is like, how long do I have to wait for the sequel? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And I'm just thinking about what the characters are doing, and there are so many loose ends that didn't get tied up. And then you're just like, well, might as well just read it again. (laughs) (laughs) But you can't because your roommate stole it. Oh, no, that's right. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I don't know we were recording when we talked about that. I don't remember. Yes, we were. (laughs) Yeah, I hope she's enjoying it right now. I hope she listens and feels immense shame. 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 <laughs> She's going to give me a lot of shit. Like, you told me to borrow it. <laughs> Which I did. Um, I mean, the world she created was very interesting, but it's not explained. It's just kind of, it's out there and it's very, like, matter of fact, like, this is what people do and this is the magic they use but it doesn't go into like the why or how of it like you mentioned earlier yeah so readers who who hate those unanswered world building questions might be a little frustrated reading this yes if you really need to know like what's happening in the larger world this wouldn't be a good one for you maybe after the sequel comes out you could read them back to back because i think that's going to be set a little bit more in the like world, but this was such a small confined area and she didn't explain anything that wasn't immediately relevant. It's kind of like a weird little microcosm of these like space necromancers and who are like trapped in a haunted space castle. Right. And you're like, how did you even like, why is your world based on, again, why, why does necromancy run everything? I feel like it's this. Yeah. And they've got, they have like advanced tech, like space shuttles and stuff, but Mm -hmm. You know, there's no real discussion on how, like, tech and magic and, you know, none of that. Yeah, no. But that's not the important stuff. It's not. Not at all. I actually really enjoyed <laughs> Don't they, like, worry about it. I really enjoyed when they go down into the tunnel and it's super, like, high tech and, uh, like, metal and plastic and glass. And, like, we would think of being very futuristic. And they're like, it was so old-fashioned and anachronistic. Because <laughs> everything now is just skulls and black and that's that's uh, a <laughs> with the present fashion. So there is a romantic thread in the book. I was just going to ask about that. Oh. It's like you're in my head. <laughs> Brain twins. Also, um, I just googled Gideon the Ninth fan fiction, and there is some small amount of it. I imagine that archive will grow. Hopefully, I mean the book is pretty good on its own. Um, ending aside, but what did you think of of the? The romantic elements in it, AJ. I wanted more. I want you yes. Know, if, you, if you say lesbian necromancers, I want to see some girls kiss girls. Yeah, and that didn't uh, really happen. And and I was really hoping for some Gideon Harrow hate sex. I know <laughs> that's what I wanted. At the end, though, I kind of like laughed because it's like the climax of the scene. And, like, Harrow's like, please, like, Gideon, don't leave. And, like, Gideon's parting line was like, see you on the other side, sugar tits. <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> she starts calling her all of the pet names. She's like, my crepuscular queen. And I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> so I I definitely was thinking, like, oh, this is what fan fiction is for, is to fulfill this need for me until the sequel. Um, yeah. I'm curious how much there's going to be, because a lot of times – Fem slash doesn't really get written in the same quantities that you see male male. Oh yeah. So because like there's been a few things that I've read and watched lately that I was like, there's gonna be so much fan fiction for this, and there was not. Oceans eight, for example. Not enough. Fan oh, for that. really? Yeah. I'm I was shocked. So right? I'm like, why is nobody writing the Kate Blanchett, Sandra Bullock, like coffee shop AU of my dreams? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of hate fucking lesbians, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a thing. I liked so much of how she was setting up the romance and then it didn't ever get um what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't like fully realized. Like you yeah. get like just the start of 
them realizing there's like feelings and stuff like that. Um, but there's not really any sort of uh, like physical affection or or anything like that. It the no, romance is definitely a backseat to like the larger political goings on. Yeah, definitely. There, there's a there's a hug one time. I think that's it. Yeah. It is definitely like very much stated on the page that they are both attracted to women though. It's not it's definitely not subtext. Like at the the very first line is something like uh Gideon Nav packed up her clothes, her swords and her dirty magazines and re- was ready to escape the ninth house. And then later on there it's like there's so many tits in your dirty magazines. Yeah, like she scandalizes that like one old advisor <laughs> be like listen i'll give you some of my magazines if you just let me go <laughs> and he is like affronted and then later Hera's like well there really, really is some terrible stuff in those which actually how does harrow know what's in gideon's dirty magazines oh she probably roots through her stuff uh, yeah that's i wouldn't put it past her that yeah that checks out <laughs> 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 they have this such a weird like classic love hate relationship i would say because they they talked about the fact that they were the only other child that the other one had to like play yes with. but um, there's clearly like a power dynamic like they're the only people that they have to play with but gideon is still a servant mm-hmm. and harrow is like part of the ruling class for that house yeah, and as much as Gideon says she hates Harrow, I noticed that she never disobeys Harrow. Like even Ooh, when they good get, point. Yeah, like even when they get to the house and Harrow says don't talk to anyone, Gideon doesn't. <sighs> even though she hasn't she like doesn't even see Harrow. So she's pretending to be under a vow of silence for like two thirds of the book. And I think so I their relationship I think has a certain degree of respect in that you know, Gideon may give Harrow shit and be unhappy, like, with her station, but Gideon, I I think, also can sense when she's out of her depth, Mm -hmm. because Gideon doesn't, like, play politics. Gideon is, like, the brawn to Harrow's brain sort of deal. Not that neither of them are not smart or not strong, but, you know, um, Harrow's more tapped into this sort of, like, political machinations and you know if she tells Gideon hey don't say anything Gideon probably like I I respect that Gideon doesn't try to show up Harrow and like flex her her power and you know just realizes that Harrow probably knows what she's talking about yeah there's several points uh, in the story where someone's like, and the ninth house already figured out such and such, and Gideon's like, well, I didn't. That, was- <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. I had no idea what you were talking about, but Harrow obviously knew. So yeah, and she also respects Harrow's necromancy a lot. And yes. She never will argue that Harrow's not good at what she does. Which she, very clearly in the text, is super, super good at what she does, because there's several points when someone's like, that's not possible, and Harrow's like, I could do that. Which was always uh, pretty fun to read. It's like, you can't, you can't make a skeleton autonomous, and Harrow's like, yeah, well, I can. Well, like, (laughs) it's revealed early on in the book that Harrow's parents are quote-unquote still alive, but they're not alive. They had technically died years prior, and Harrow just had reanimated them. <laughs> That's right. I forgot. So nobody knows she's she's the heir of the ninth house officially, and nobody knows that her parents are dead. Because that's the con she pulls on Gideon at the very beginning too. Is she's like, "I'll give you this like paper that will get you into the army," and then she signs it with her mother's name. So Harrow can't, or uh, Gideon can't blackmail her. Yeah. With the fact that he knows that her mother is dead, because if she does, then the paper's worthless. Oh, man. This book is so fun. It is really Everything fun. happens so much. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I like is, like, it is a, a larger book. 
and it may seem like daunting, but I never got the sense of it slogging or dragging or like reading like, oh, this is a boring spot. Yeah, very much so. Every It didn't feel like any page was wasted or anything was happening that wasn't furthering the plot. Yeah. And it was also very creative. Like I am one of those annoying people who guesses the plot of the movie in yes. the first five minutes and can tell you the twist. <laughs> and some of what happened actually was really surprising. Like I did not expect the end at I all. I did not either. And that made me kind of sad because that's not the ending I would have wanted either. <laughs> It makes sense, but you know, as a romance reader too, like I want to, I want some happy smooching at the end. Right? I wanted them to be happy together and like smooch their face paint off and then go off to be lictors and like just, you know, wear all black all the time. Yeah, with the veil or whatever like a, it is. Doesn't it? A great a power couple. Yeah, exactly. And there was so much about Gideon that seemed, again, that like magical girl, super special person that I did not think she was going to die. Like you've set up all this stuff about how special she is. And then. And the book is named after her. (laughs) And the book is named after her. It's almost like the ending. It's okay. It did not make me as mad as this, but it's almost like the ending of. Uh, Feed by Mira Grant, if you've read that. This is a Oh masterpiece. my gosh, yes. <laughs> but it, it's the same kind of thing. And that one made me really mad because I didn't think it was properly set up in the text. I cried my eyes out. Oh my gosh. I can't, I can't read the rest of the series. I'm too sad about I, it. No, I stopped. Well, spoiler. So you wanna, if you want to hear something very awkward, I wrote um, a post for Smart Bitch. <laughs> Is about why I love feed so much and it's because like I have a really close relationship with my brother and you know that relationship um really like spoke to me and I how I like sobbed my eyes out during the scene where you know she is starting to turn into a zombie and she's like typing on the computer and she's essentially asking her brother to kill her and you know, make sure she doesn't turn into a zombie. And what I didn't know, and probably what you don't know since you didn't continue the series, is people in the comments were like, okay, this is a great piece and everything, but it's a little weird that you reference, you know, like the the sibling relationship, because later in the series, it's revealed that they're not like, they're like, not... I wouldn't say like clones, but they're like, they were created and they also had like an incestuous relationship. Uh. Oh my. Well. Yeah. So I was like, oh, Ooh, this is very <laughs> awkward. Yeah. Wow. And now I'm kind of glad I never finished it. So I just, I'm going to keep that experience locked away in a little bubble and never think about it sometimes, again. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to do that. <laughs> Like, well, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put this book aside and I'm gonna never read the rest and it's gonna exist for me exactly as I knew it to yep. be and la la la, <laughs> la, 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 la. Oh, oh oh there are many things that I have done that with. I'm hoping that Gideon the Ninth in this series won't be one of them, although it would be possible from where they from where she left it to mess it up to a point where I would be like, La 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 la, I didn't read the second one. Sequels are, are hard and they give me great anxiety. I mean, I'm still sad they only made one Matrix movie. (laughs) I often feel with a book like this and a a series of similar size um, that when there's a sequel, this is such there. I'm I'm a terrible person. I acknowledge this up front. There is a sense of you are really asking a lot of my time here, and I need to trust that you're not going to fuck this up. Yeah, and and I feel like a total ass for having that attitude because it's like, I don't have to read this series. I don't have to. There are lots of other things I could read, but when I'm considering it and it's not done and I realize that, you know, if you don't buy it in progress, it may never be done. There's like, there's like a, 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 a dichotomy to the decision. Do I buy it? Do I not? Um, I have to trust in the ending and the fact that the person or persons writing know where they are going. And sometimes I don't. So I'm out. 
And I, I am terrible about series for that reason. Um, the Sisters by Stephanie Lauren, that's a one book series. Did you know that? <laughs> now I do. Harry Potter's like three books. <laughs> oh, don't even yeah. talk to me about yeah. the fifth Harry Potter book. I bailed in the middle of the fourth and have no regrets to my decision. Yeah, that I, I started reading the fourth book, was like, man, she needs an editor. I'm done with this. Never went back. So all I know about <laughs> Harry Potter is what I read in Harry Potter fan fiction. And it seems like a great series. I, I've well, heard just, there's no epilogue so at all. It's so funny as a romance reader and the stuff that I can, like the angst that I can put up with. But the fifth book was it Order of the Phoenix. I was like, God damn it, Harry. You are the whiniest boy I have ever read about. And I'm done. I can't. I have so many, I have so many frustrations. We were in New York and we got tickets to see uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, which I imagine some people listening to this will be like, oh, that's so wasted on you. First of all, as an act of um, stagecraft, that play is astonishing. Like it is visually staggeringly good. And the story is, is uh, sort of on par, but I look at that and all of the other books and I'm like, Harry Potter and why don't these people have therapy? <laughs> Harry Potter and where is the pastoral care in this world? <laughs> Harry Potter and dead kids don't matter. Like, come on. I can't get back into it, even though I appreciate so many things about the world. And I appreciate it, especially with the play. Like they had custom carpet. They had custom decorations in the theater. They had every everything you looked at was part of entering the world of the books and the play from the minute you entered the theater. And I have so much appreciation and admiration for that. It's sort of like going to uh, Diagon Alley in Universal Florida because the construction of that area uses so many tricks of um, depth perception to make it look bigger and fun. Yeah, when you see like Hogwarts on the hill, you think it's massive. No, it would like fit in my car. It's not. Yeah. It's the, the tricks of deception and the way that stagecraft is used to create those two areas in the theme parks is amazing. I could hang out and look at all the details for days. But if you get me started on the books, I just start ranting. Yeah, it's Harry Potter and the untreated, massive, complex PTSD. Like, yes, Harry Potter and these people need yes. therapy. And I know some people like shit on the fact that oh, if Hermione Granger were the heroine, it wouldn't be as exciting. Wrong, wrong. <laughs> the series would probably only be one book long because. It wouldn't be a series because Hermione wouldn't put up with that nonsense and she would fix all the problems and then we would move on with our lives. My favorite headcanon about Harry Potter post books is when Hermione finds out that Harry has named his kid Albus Severus and the 25 year rant that she goes on <laughs> with, at Ron. That, like what is wrong with you? Do you remember him making fun of my teeth and my hair? Do you remember him having his entire house laugh at my appearance? I was 10. Do you remember any of that? Abusive motherfucking assholes. And don't even get me started on that bastard with a suicide murder plot that it was like, you know, we're just going to kill you and that's fine. Yeah, let's definitely name children after those two. Like I can just imagine Ron in all of the different actor carnations like, yep, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely right. You're totally right. Right, dear, I, you should tell him. Absolutely, you should. You can call him. Like, oh, let's, let's sit down and have a cup of tea before you call him. But yeah, absolutely, over and over. And I always wonder, like, what what's Hermione going to call this kid? Because you know she's not going to call him by those names. She's going to call him <laughs> Remus Serious Potter. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to call you Do Over, my small child. <laughs> We're going to redo your names. Well, going to call him. What's? Did you guys see that thing on the internet one time that was the guy naming his cat? And he wanted to name it after the two bravest men he ever met, so he named it Two Robocops. <laughs> two Robocops. <laughs> I'm going to call him Two Robocops Potter. I would read a whole bunch of books about Two Robocops Potter, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. And how none of the wizards understand what his name is a reference to. I kind of want to read that now. You, 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 I would you read should. that fanfic. I know for a while there was a, a fanfic blog about Hogwarts tech support. Yes. Oh my gosh, I need that in my life. 
Amanda, I, do you still have the link? It was basically like finally the muggles were like, this is ridiculous. I'm not writing it was on these. Tumblr, I think. Yeah, and it was basically this one guy who got hired to do tech support because they brought internet to, to Hogwarts. It's called uh, the Setup Wizard. The Setup oh. Wizard, which. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll DM it to you. Oh. Please do, yeah. Because I, the one thing I did not mention in my intro is that my day job is tech support. So oh, that's dude. going to hit me a lot of ways. Dude. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it in the shared one. But yeah, I mean, it's it's over now. They, like, wrapped it up, but the archives are still there. I, I'm going to read through that. I'm probably also going to make my coworkers read through that. Be like, <laughs> listen to this one. AJ, I used but, to do yes. tech support, too. I used to wander all over Manhattan and go into people's homes and remove malware from their computers because they absolutely were not looking at porn. How dare I even suggest such a thing? And I look back and that was not the safest job I ever had, but I had a great time. Like I just wandered all over Manhattan with a backpack full of screwdrivers and fixed people's desktops. What was the weirdest house you went into? I went to the uh, penthouse apartment of a famous writer who absolutely owned that he had been looking for porn uh, for research purposes. He was doing a uh, deep study for a character in a project he was working on with a bunch of other writers um was it francis no 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 no. it's (laughs) it's an older dude very much older than me and the he was a delight he went out of his way to like welcome me and was like i'm gonna call your boss and let her know you're here just give me a moment put her on speakerphone it was like i just want you to know sarah's here we're gonna have a cup of tea we're gonna fix this infernal computer that doesn't work and i he was utterly gloriously fun and told me the best raunchy stories and was obsessed with feeding me and i would probably have to go to his apartment once every two months because he was researching predators so he would hang out in places where predators were and the malware that you get my god yeah he was like they're gross i cannot wait to like create one and then destroy him and i was like oh yes tell me more (laughs) so that's my that was my favorite that was my absolute favorite and I wish I had any stories that good. I just work in a call center, so it's just people calling me and being like, "Yeah, my your your website's frozen." Oh, dude! Uh, it, it tech yeah. support and the phone. Uh. I I have some fun. Sometimes people will call in and just t- want to tell me random stories about their life. One guy gave me his recipe for a dark and stormy. Um, ooh, ooh, I love a good dark and stormy. Yeah, it was a good recipe. Uh, so I, you know, there's side benefits, but mostly it's just me being like, okay. Uh, let's clear your cash and cookies. Great, great. Does it work now? Yeah. It does. Wonderful. Well, you have a great day. Please clear your cash and cookies regularly. I don't do that at home, but you should. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at Gideon the Ninth, yes. how many times do you think you will read it again? Uh, for me, at least two more times before the next book comes out. Yep. That sounds about right. I'm a big rereader, so... It could be more if I run out of new things. Hi, yeah, that'll happen. But definitely a couple. (laughs) So is this one of your best books of the year? I don't know if I would say like best books, but it's definitely one of the most entertaining books I've read this year. I would definitely say this is one of the best books I've read this year. And I'm trying to remember any other book that I've read this year. (laughs) Yeah, this is up there for sure. And this book like took over both of your brains, right? Like you're still thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All the time. I Like, just how, what? And then, why? Like, the the the. So, are you thinking <laughs> about, like, all the unanswered things and all the, but wait, wait, wait a minute, what happened to that character? Like, all of the things that weren't fully resolved? I don't think about it too much. I just keep thinking about the ending, mainly. And it also just makes my heart so happy when I'm in the bookstore and I see people buying them. So, <laughs> I I think about some of the unanswered questions. I keep thinking, and I may have already said this because I'm losing track of what I said, but I keep thinking this just feels like if in a and d campaign, Dungeons and Dragons campaign, if the party failed to kill the Lich King, this is the world you would get after the party was like killed. Oh. It's just the necromancers taking over. I would agree. And so... I keep thinking how much of a fun D&D world this would be. <laughs> Someone do it. I play Dungeons and Dragons with my roommate who has currently borrowed the book and she's our DM and I feel like I could talk her into this. 
Hopefully she feels inspired. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, the D&D campaigns that could come out of this story. Yeah, you could do so much like lawful evil, just mayhem with it. I, I feel like you can tell you have a good, uh, d- well-developed character when I'm done reading the book and I'm like, but what are they doing after I turn the page? Like after I turn the last page, what are they up to right now? So I have an interesting question that I just thought of. So, you know, in Harry Potter, everyone's like, what house are you? What what house do you think you'd be in? Ooh. Ooh. So the second is the army, so definitely not the second. <laughs> <laughs> not the eighth, because they were jerks. I, I think I might be in the sixth house. Like the... The scholars? Uh, the scholars, yeah. I don't think I would be in the seventh house, but that's what, like, appeals to me the most. Is the, like, like, artistic house? Yeah, they're, like, ones? yeah, they're, like, for beauty and stuff like that. And I just, like, think it's cool, like, marrying necromancers with, like, art and flowers. I don't... Right. Do, they bring, do they bring the flowers back to life? Because I feel like they must. They must have, like, undying flowers that they just keep, like, necromancing. Oh, my God. That'd be fantastic. I want to be this in the seventh house. That's what I want to be in. That checks out. That'd probably be a really fun house. I think it would be. As much as any necromancy house is fun. But everybody seemed to be having a good time. <laughs> everybody <laughs> seemed to be having a good time. I mean, you know, other than the dead people. But even them. Some it's just of them. like essentially the Adams family, where they're all just fucking weird, but they just love being weird <laughs> together. Like as much as Gideon hates being in the ninth house, like and the ninth house, uh, Sarah is like dark and it's a crypt, and everybody there is either a nun or a priest of this like death cult, and everybody wears skull face cool. paint. They seem to really enjoy it, and it's so normal to them that. You don't get the sense that she's been traumatized by it or that, like, it's depressed. And can you imagine, like, Gideon being anywhere else? No. Not- I th- I think the ninth is, like, the perfect fit for Gideon. Because anywhere else they would have also, like, not let her just be as snarky and, and weird as she is. Yes. But she grew up in a house with no- really no adults. It was just like the arms mistress that trained her and the one dude that hates her and Harrow. And Harrow. Yeah. I was going to say, anyway, the book is good and everyone okay. should read it. So if, if okay. it's too long, didn't listen, every everyone should read it. Yeah. It's also, it's macabre, but it's not scary. I'm a massive wimp about horror and I get nightmares and this did not give me any nightmares. And it's not like a heavy read either. It feels like pretty light given the... Yeah, it's... The creepiness it's of it. really funny in parts i wish i had some some quotes but some of the lines are hysterical yes so if you like reading about death but also laughing um okay recommended so i know you guys <laughs> both have book hangover is there anything that you are reading or want to read now or do you just i want to read this again i'm about to start a book that i've been putting off just because like I want to savor it by not reading it, if that makes any sense. Yep. It is the follow-up to Polaris Rising, which is Aurora Blazing. I'm going to start it today or tomorrow. And one of my friends has already read it, and she loved it. And I trust her opinion. But it's also like, but if I start it, then I have to finish it, and then it will be <laughs> over. <laughs> you have bad book hangover. It's <laughs> really bad. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been trying to convince myself to read something else. Um I have not yet managed it. I've been um knitting myself some black socks to <laughs> to uh deal with my hangover. I have Magic for Liars by Sarah Gailey. Ooh. Which I've also been savoring by not reading. <laughs> I keep thinking, of- isn't that kind of sad? You're like, I really want to read it, but I don't want to read it. I, like, but, mm, but then if if I read it, and like, what if it's, what if it gives me more book hangover, and then I'm just like double hungover. I, you're just in like the the pit of hangover. I really am. <laughs> 
I should probably just look up some fan fiction. That's usually how I get over that. But then I get in then I get in fan fiction mode, and once once I start reading fan fiction, it's that's three days of my life. Just completely. Mad. Yeah, and then you're like, oh boy, I have all these books to read now. <laughs> I feel like I just downloaded something else that could help clear the hangover. Oh, I just got the um, Queen of Rhodia, the new Effie Calvin book. So oh, I might uh. Maybe that'll that's that's different enough that it might break me out of my my goth stupor. Have you read the second one? Yeah, I have. Daughter of the Sun. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I was just looking at that today because I was inputting books. Was it good? Was it as good as um, the first book? Yes. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a little bit different. So the first book felt a little bit more high fantasy to me. It was you know princesses getting married and fighting dragons and it's like got all of that you know courtly drama kind of thing and the second one's a road trip book so it's a lawful good paladin and a goddess of chaos go on a road trip to stop evil oh my gosh that speaks to me on so many levels <laughs> it's yep same i was like oh, oh <laughs> opposites attract eh i could do this so yeah i really and a road trip on a road trip and yeah, it was, I definitely recommend both of, the, of her books that I've read. And then I'm excited to see how the third, the thir- third one supposedly is going to tie the first two together is what I've heard. Like the first two are very different characters. And then the third one involves both, I think, but it will definitely be a tone change. I'll say that there's no necromancy in, in that. <laughs> No, like I just got the tour newsletter and it's like breaking down the Gideon of the ninth cover. Oh, it's like they know. <laughs> They're just messing How? with you at this point. I know. I was like, what a coincidence. Oh, I swear oh, I man. don't I didn't tell anybody that we were recording this at this time. <laughs> I swear I did not. I, I told my roommate and I know tour.com is bugging my house, so it's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tor. How you doing today? <laughs> oh, man, I'm just looking at this cover now. This is this cover is so good. It really does what it needs to do. Yeah. Like, like talk yes. about cover awe. Not only it does what it needs to do, it has the character exactly as she's described in the book, which so many covers do not do, and it drives me bananas. And it's got that pose of, like, cool guys don't look yes. at explosions you know <laughs> that's exactly what it is and she's got the aviators and they zoom in on her yeah. face and she's got like a smirk that i never caught before yep yep hair is half pompadour half bohawk the type of hair intended to say ladies start your engines <laughs> <laughs> i've just been attacked i did not come here to be attacked like this. <laughs> i'm so sorry aj i'm so sorry oh your fault. it's tour.com attacking me so not cool uh tour if you're listening uh can we get like a poster or something of the cover yes i there? would put that on my wall i would move one of the bookshelves to put that on my wall <laughs> <laughs> oh. i don't know why more publishers don't create book covers into to prints to like sell because some some covers, especially in like YA, are right? Like the gorgeous. Rainbow Roll uh, covers that Kevin Wada did for her. I mean, my roommate went out and spent real human dollars on the Kevin Wada life size cutout of Baz, and it now lives in our house. <laughs> I did not know that was a thing, and I kind of need it. <laughs> it goes so well with my life size cut out of Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, no, we have a huge cardboard cutout in our home. My roommate's going to the Rainbow Rowl event in Boston soon, and everyone is trying to do their best to convince her to take him with her to the event to get Rainbow to like sign him or something. I don't know how Seconded. how successfully we've convinced her, but everyone's like, you gotta take him. You gotta take him. All right. I am going to hit stop unless you have anything else you want to add. Not from me. Uh, the only other thing I have in my notes is in conclusion, screaming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In conclusion, screaming. Okay. Works. 
And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. I am curious, are you going to read Gideon the Ninth? Have you already read it? Are you obsessed? Are you making a Halloween costume like AJ? We have, cannot wait to show you the pictures. They're amazing. I would love to hear from you about this book or any other book you're obsessed with. You can email me at sbjpodcast at gmail.com. You can leave me a message or tell me a terrible joke at 12013713272. I also want to tell you that Smart Podcast Trashy Books is now on the Radio.com mobile app, which is way cool. You can find Amanda and AJ on Smart Bitches, obviously, and Amanda's on Twitter at underscore I'm an adult. AJ is at Gay Robot Socks, which is so great. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Once a Spy by Mary Jo Putney. Can a marriage of convenience for two spies blossom into something more? Renowned for her unique blend of adventure, wit, and sweeping romance, New York Times best-selling author Mary Jo Putney matches Simon, a dashing spy, with Suzanne, a French woman whose past will bear no scrutiny. Neither wanted or expected a true marriage, but as Suzanne joins Simon in a search for his long-missing foster brother, warmth and caring begin to heal both their scars, and a powerful passion sparks between them. Then news from France threatens to disrupt their happiness. Napoleon has escaped from Elba, and Wellington personally asks Simon to help prevent another devastating war. Only this time, Simon does not go into danger alone. Their hard-fought love grows against the backdrop of the Battle of Waterloo in the latest Rogue's Redeemed novel. Once a Spy by Mary Jo Putney is on sale now wherever books are sold and at kensingtonbooks.com. You can find more information at maryjoputney.com. The transcript for this episode is being brought to you by our podcast Patreon community. Thank you to the Patreon supporters who are making sure that every episode is accessible and that the show continues every week. If you would like to join the Patreon community, have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. Thank you so very much for your support. The music you're listening to is provided by Sassy Outwater. She's on Twitter. Guess where? At Sassy Outwater. This is a band called Sketch. This track is called Out of My Cage, and it is from their album Shed Life. You can find it on Amazon or on iTunes or wherever you buy your funky, funky music. In the show notes for this episode at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast, I will have links to all of the things that we talked about, including the small but growing cache of Gideon the Ninth fanfic, the setup wizard, all of the discussions about the covers, the Reddit Ask Me Anything with author Tamsin Mir, and Amanda's review of Gideon the Ninth. So if you were like, I want to wait, wait, stop, go back. I want to know what that is. All the links are in the show notes, so never fear. And if you're going to go over to Smart Bitches, I can also tell you what's coming up this week. We have so many reviews. Holy smokes. Every book ever is coming out in October, and we are reviewing so many of them. And there's so many you're going to want to read, too. We also have Cover Snark, Help a Bitch Out, and, of course, books on sale every day. So come on over and hang out with us. As always, I end the show with a terrible joke. So if you have listened all the way to the end, you get rewarded by truly awful humor. And you know what? You, you deserve really good bad jokes, right? Okay, so keeping with our necromancy theme, are you ready? <clears throat> Why are skeletons so calm? Why are skeletons super calm and chill? Because nothing gets under their skin. <laughs> now, I will give you a bonus joke because I'm terrible. Uh, my older son plays many, many instruments, including many, many brass instruments. So I like to follow him around and say, hey, hey, what, what's a skeleton's favorite instrument? Huh? What's a, fa what, what, what's a skeleton's favorite instrument? And then he rolls his eyes and walks away because he's almost 14. But if you're curious, the skeleton's favorite instrument is the trombone. <laughs> I love bad jokes. I like telling them at dinner because then everyone groans. It's great. I hope you enjoy them too. On behalf of everyone here, AJ, Amanda, all of the lesbian necromancers in space, we wish you the very best of reading. Have a great weekend and we'll see you back here next week. <laughs> <laughs>